Professor F.R. Scott of McGill University explains why the Canadian Federation is a compromise between a centralized state like Britain's and a federation like that of the United States. The Canadian Constitution is not something that was made all at one time in 1867. Its roots go back far before Confederation, and it has been modified since, both in form and in practice. Much of it was copied from England, but even the more Canadian parts were the result of years of gradual evolution. Before there was a legislature in central Canada, the Quebec Act of 1774 guaranteed the continuation of French law for Quebec and the free practice of the Roman Catholic religion. The use of two official languages was finally established in 1848. The federal form of government was not known to our public law before 1867, but in the old province of Canada, set up in 1841, a kind of practical federalism had developed with the double majority rule. Separate schools, too, were already in existence in Canada. So by the time the BNA Act came to be drafted, the most basic principles of our present Constitution were part of the law and history of our people, at least in the central provinces. What was quite new in 1867, of course, was the federal union of all the provinces into a country that was seen as stretching from sea to sea. Note the two words, federal and union. There was certainly to be union, Indeed, the BNA Act is called an act for the union of the provinces, and the word union appears all through the statute. Before 1867, Nova Scotia was as separate from Prince Edward Island as Bermuda is, say, from Jamaica. Each province was a British colony under the single crown, but with its own government that made its own domestic laws on all matters. After union, the Canadian provinces lost much of their autonomy, and they became part of a larger whole called Canada. But they did not lose their identity. They too are governments with a large and important sphere of jurisdiction reserved to them. This constitutional autonomy for provinces is particularly cherished in Quebec, for the French and Catholic majority of Quebec is thereby given control of those laws which most closely affect its culture and way of life. Every federal state decides for itself whether it prefers centralization or decentralization. That is to say, whether it will have a strong or weak central government. Some centralization there must be, or there is no union of any kind. Some local autonomy there must be, or there will be no provinces. Hence, no one can be wholly against centralization, or wholly against autonomy, if he believes in federalism. The fathers of the Canadian federal state, led by John A. MacDonald, favored a strong central authority. Seeing how the United States in 1861 had broken into two parts and suffered a grievous civil war because of the doctrine of states' rights, or provincial autonomy, as we would call it, they wanted to make sure that this country would never disintegrate. So they leaned toward centralization without denying reasonable latitude for local governments. Hence, there are many provisions in our Constitution which, like the federal veto of provincial laws, give Ottawa predominant powers in the law of the Constitution. In practice, however, these have not often been used, and indeed, to many people, the provinces have sometimes seemed so strong that they could dictate to Ottawa what the national policy should be. Until the Conservatives won the last election, we used to say that the only opposition to the federal government lay in provincial legislatures. This was not a healthy situation, for provincial politicians are not supposed to deal with national matters but only with those subjects reserved to provinces by the Constitution. The actual division of powers between Ottawa and the provinces was based on the simple idea that all matters of national importance should be given to the central government, and all matters of local importance were to be left to local governments. To make this principle more certain, Section 91 of the BNA Act lists a number of federal powers, like trade and commerce, defense, navigation, criminal law, and so on, while Section 92 lists provincial powers, of which the most important is property and civil rights in the province. The residue of unspecified powers rests with Ottawa. Then education is treated separately in Section 93 because the separate schools had to be protected. Provincial autonomy over education is more restricted than over other provincial subjects. That this original scheme of distribution was pretty sound is shown by the fact that only two amendments, shifting powers from provinces to the federal parliament, 
have been made since 1867, namely those for unemployment insurance and old age pensions. <laughs>